Today we're out here taking a look at the 2016 Audi S7. The A7, S7, and RS7 are designed to compete with the BMW 6 Series Grand Coupe and the Mercedes-Benz CLS. Those three vehicles are in this luxury category called a mid-sized four-door coupe. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, this has a few too many doors in order to be a coupe, then you're right in my book. However, in this modern definition of the word, it seems to refer more to the shape of the vehicle overall than the exact number of doors that we get. Up front, we have the same aggressive look as we get in the rest of the Audi family with this very large grill here. Of course, this has been hardened a little bit with slightly more angular bends all the way around. And of course, because we're in the sporty version, the grille is blacked out, as are the rest of the trim strips across the front. Our model also has full LED headlamps, those are standard on the S6 model. In terms of design, the A7 started out as an A6, and then they altered it to give us this side profile. That involved giving this about two inches of extra length versus the A6, swapping out the trunk for that lift back that we see in the rear. This is essentially the same thing that Mercedes-Benz did with the E-Class to create the CLS but it's different than BMW and their 6 Series Grand Coupe because the 6 Series already existed as a two-door coupe, and they basically took that two-door coupe and stretched it to create this same sort of profile. That means that while this shares interiors with the A6 and the CLS shares interiors with the E-Class, the 6 Series does not share interiors with the 5 Series. The difference is also noticeable right back here because the 6 Series Grand Coupe gets an actual trunk, not a liftback. That means that while we still get limited rear seat dimensions, we don't get the increased cargo practicality that we find in the Audi. You can really see the big difference between this and the design of the A6 out back because this gets a much more aggressive wedge shape back here and it looks almost like this rear end is actually leaning backwards a little bit, although it doesn't actually. We get a small spoiler right up top here that pops pops up over a certain speed. Even though they have been updated relatively recently, the A6 and S6 still have a rear end design that's a little bit more bubbly than we get right here in the A7 or S7. Of course, we get these very large exaggerated quad exhaust tips out back here, and the same sort of treatment going on that we had in the front headlamp is mirrored right back here in the rear tail lamp module. If you get the A7, then we have the same engine that we find in the A6 that we recently tested. It's a 3-liter supercharged V6 engine. It produces 333 horsepower and 325 pound-feet of torque. Now that engine difference accounts for some of the reason that the A7 is so much more expensive than a base A6, because the A6 starts with a 2-liter 4-cylinder engine and front-wheel drive, and all versions of the A7 in the United States get standard all-wheel drive, and the base engine is that 3-liter supercharged 6. The S7 that we're testing right here has a twin turbocharged 4-liter V8, producing 450 horsepower and 406 pound-feet of torque. This gets a different transmission. It now uses a 7-speed dual clutch. All-wheel drive is, of course, still standard even on this model, so there's no rear-wheel drive version in the U.S. like you do find in certain models of the CLS or the BMW 6 Series. If this isn't enough power for you, then there is a different twin-turbo version of basically this same engine that makes 500 60 horsepower and 516 pound-feet of torque. Now because of the amount of power that engine produces, Audi goes back to a traditional 8-speed automatic transmission and yet again standard all-wheel drive. Just like the A4, A6, and A8, the entire engine is actually in front of the front axle. The front axle is right around here in the vehicle. You can see that this whole engine is in front of it. The reason for that is because the all-wheel drive system and the transmission are actually put inside one case rather than being separate units. It's just a sort of a design choice of Audis. It's fairly common in the performance car category to use a staggered tire design, and that would be where the rear tires are wider than the front tires. However, because of the general drivetrain design that we get in Audi models, where the entire engine is actually in front of the front axle, Audi takes a slightly different tact here, and they actually give us extremely wide front tires as well. These are 275 30R21s, which are extremely wide. They're also extremely low profile. We find exactly the same ones up front as in the back. One thing I'd like to point out under the hood here is just how this engine is arranged. Very much like we see in the other German entries, the exhaust and intake flow in this V8 is actually reversed. So normally the intake is right here in the valley of the V, and the exhaust is out here on either side. This engine is actually opposite to that, and the exhaust is right here in the valley of the V, and the intakes are on each side. That means that the turbochargers are right here on top of the engine. The reason we do that is, as you can see, the length of the plumbing from the exhaust turbine side of the turbocharger right there to this exhaust header on the engine is incredibly short, and that means that we have much better turbo response time than you find in other engine designs. Of course, it does result in this very interesting packaging we see right on top. It looks sort of like a Medusa's head right here. We can see that the intercooler is right up front here. It's a water-to-air intercooler design. 
The compressor exhaust side of the turbos are right here. These lead off to the air cleaner on that side. It is quite an impressive feat of engineering that they can actually jam all of this under the hood. When it comes to front seat comfort, I'm going to give these seats 8 out of 10 points. We do have the optional four-way adjustable lumbar support right over here, and we have the power tilt telescopic steering column. Now, these seats are very, very comfortable. However, they're just not quite as adjustable as we find in the Mercedes or in the BMW if you select their optional seats. Rear seat comfort is not necessarily what this kind of vehicle is after, and I'm going to have to give this 6 out of 10 points as a result. That actually goes for all three entries in this segment. The overall design of this four-door coupe is to give you this sexy side profile, and that's just not compatible with rear seat headroom. At six feet tall, sitting back in this seat, I do have a decent amount of legroom sitting right here behind myself, about two inches there, but I can't actually sit upright in the back. I do have to cock my head to the side at a pretty severe angle in order to sit upright, or slouch actually this far in order to keep my head from touching the ceiling. In addition to that, the S7 has no center seat back here, so you can't fit five people in the vehicle. This is a four seat vehicle only. That said, I appreciate the practicality of the 6040 fold flat rear seats. And we also have a softly padded center armrest with some additional storage right here and a ski pass through to the back. Now, personally, I would have found a 40-20-40 folding rear seat back a little bit more practical because we do have a lift back in the A7, not a traditional trunk. And that means that we have an awful lot more cargo room back here than you'll find in a traditional trunked vehicle. In terms of practicality, you can remove the fixed cargo cover that's right over here on the tailgate itself and this shelf right back here. You can then fold down both rear seats and you can actually put things like a large barbecue from Home Depot right in the back of the A7, and you just can't do that in a 5 Series or an A6 or anything along those lines. This is an awful lot more practical, and that makes this more practical than we find in the 6 Series Grand Coupe, which does have that traditional trunk in the back. Thanks to the large amount of room we get back here, excellent fit and finish in the cargo area, cargo tie-downs back here, and a spare tire under the cargo load floor, and this power tailgate right here, I'm going to have to give this 10 out of 10 points when it comes to my exclusive trunk comfort index. Taking a quick spin around the interior, you can see that we have fixed headrests for both the front seats as well as actually the rear seats. Those headrests do not adjust out back. We have a very standard sized sunroof and then we have height adjustable seat belts for both the driver and the front passenger. Our front seats are these top end leather seats with this sort of a burgundy red design right here and quilted stitching on the seat bottom cushion and the back cushion. We also have the extending thigh cushions right there but we don't have seat ventilation in this particular model. It is available. As you'd expect in a vehicle of this category, the front doors are all soft touch plastics. We have soft touch upper right there, soft touch lower plastics, very softly padded leather armrest right there, and then this section right here in the middle is Alcantara, which is a man-made suede product. We also have real carbon fiber trim that goes on over from the doors onto the dashboard, and as you can see, this is basically the same dashboard design that we get in the A6 and the S6 except that we have carbon fiber instead of real wood trim like we had in the last Audi model we tested. That means that over here on the passenger side, we do have a glove box that's basically the same. It's a slot style arrangement, and I was barely able to fit a tablet computer inside. The S7 gets a standard 14 speaker Bose surround sound system, so we do have a center channel speaker hiding right here behind this Audi MMI screen. And the MMI screen, like many other Audi models, does move in and out of the dashboard when you turn on the vehicle or when you press this little button right over there on the dashboard. Continuing on down the dashboard, we have two large air vents right there. We also have the Audi multimedia system with a single slot optical display right there, two SD card slots, and this is where you insert and remove the SIM card that controls the built-in cell modem in this system. This does use a standard 4G cell modem that allows you access to Google Maps and that sort of thing going on. Below that we have the controls for our rear spoiler. We can turn it on and off at any speed. We also have the ability to enable or disable the start-stop system that our model has. Then below that we have the controls for our four-zone climate control system. Now our model has only the heated seats. We don't have the ventilated seats, so we don't have a button right down here for that. If you want to control the two zones in the back of the car, you do have to use a combination of these these buttons and the Audi MMI system in order to do that. We do have a small storage cubby right here in front of the shifter and that is suitable for things like small smartphones, that sort of thing. Now there are no USB or charging ports inside. Even though we do use a seven speed dual clutch transmission, we have a traditional console shifter all the way down for drive. Click at one down for drive or sport over to the right for the manual mode, up for up and down for down. 
To the left of that, we have an electric parking brake. This is a touch pad that actually changes between radio presets like you're seeing right here. We can also do finger writing recognition and scrolling around on the map display. On the right side, we have the start stop button for the vehicle itself, the power volume knob for MMI, as well as track forward backward. And then we have the buttons for the MMI system. We have direct access buttons for the radio, nav, telephone, media, etc. We also have direct access to the car settings. This is where you can change things like the way the dynamic suspension system that is standard in the S7 behaves. We have a menu button right over here. And then these are contextual buttons that light up depending on what option you have selected on the screen. Behind that, we have two large cup holders. And if you're wondering what the key in the S7 looks like, that's it right there. It's a very traditional Audi key, although we do get S7 right there on the back. The center console is a softly padded leather wrapped model. It opens to reveal a small storage cubby right there first. And then we can actually close that, click a different button, and then pull up a different storage cubby right there below that. This is where you'll find the dual USB inputs. And new for this year, we don't have to have that silly little Audi or Volkswagen dongle. We can just use a regular old USB cord for our paired smartphone, etc. You can see this is a fairly small compartment. We also have a 12 volt power outlet right up front. The S7 uses this very typical Audi two dial instrument cluster, where we also have a fuel gauge and an engine temperature gauge with little LEDs that actually constitute the gauge right there. You also notice we have a dynamic tachometer right over here. So these little LEDs turn on and indicate where the red line in the vehicle is. Now, if the engine was cold, the red line would actually be right over here at around 5,200 RPM. And the engine does honor that red line. So if you just start the car and you hop out on your favorite winding mountain road and you floor it, it won't really rev up to the about 6,500 RPM that our red line is located at right now. The speedometer is over here on the right side. And as we've seen from Audi before, it's not a linear scale. So the distance between zero and 20 is much larger than, for instance, the difference between 20 and 40. In the middle of that display, we have this large color multifunction LCD that also gives us full Google mapping. And you can see it actually showing us this satellite map imagery right there. That display is controlled via this button and knob arrangement on the steering wheel. We have this scroll knob right over here that zooms in and out on that particular display, does a few different things, of course, and then this changes between the different pages, navigation, telephone, etc. This display gives us our very typical trip computer information. We can cycle through things like our short-term memory, long-term memory, etc. We can also scoot over and get our media information so we can actually browse the playlist that we're on right now and select different tunes, as you can see. We can also click the source button and actually change the source that is currently playing on the audio system. Scooting over to the phone interface, this is your typical Bluetooth phone interface. We can actually click all of our contacts right there and actually dial them. And then of course we have the navigation interface with full traffic information and full GPS topographical information. This is a very unique and very, very attractive display. So you can see you can actually zoom very far out on this thing as well. The steering wheel is this very attractive Audi flat bottom design. We have large sport grips right up top and additional sport bump outs right there before the flat bottom portion. We have shift paddles on the back of the steering wheel, down on the left and up on the right, and they're also illuminated at night. Same control panel that I showed you earlier right over here. On the right side of the steering wheel is where you'll find volume up, down, mute. Click that in for mute. We have a programmable button right there. Repeat our navigation instructions and our voice command button. The radar dynamic cruise control is handled via the stock on the back of the steering column. We pull in for resume, push in once for cancel, all the way back for off. The distance is controlled via this little toggle right up on top. We set the speed here with this button, and then we increase and decrease the speed by moving this up and down. The first thing you'll notice about the S7 out on the road is the incredible acceleration from this engine. And I would actually say acceleration that honestly surprised me, because with 450 horsepower under the hood, I didn't expect this to be as fast as the last BMW M6 that we tested to 60. However, the difference here is that this vehicle has all-wheel drive, and it has that very efficient dual-clutch transmission. Dual clutch transmissions are more efficient than traditional automatics. However, traditional automatics do have a little bit of an advantage with their torque converter. It means you can actually get a little bit more torque from a standstill. And that's part of what surprised me with this because the zero to 30 time on this S7 was incredibly quick at 1.3 seconds, zero to 30. By the time we hit 60, it took only 3.9 seconds. And that is an incredibly good time for a vehicle in this category. If you want faster zero to 60 times than this, you will have to spend a considerable amount of money. You also need to keep in mind that something like the M6 Grand Coupe doesn't come with all wheel drive. 
and this vehicle will actually go from zero to 60 in about four seconds, even on this wet road that we're driving on right here. Therefore, when it comes to acceleration, I have no choice but to give the S7 an A plus in this category. This is absolutely incredible. Perhaps due to the tire choice that Audi made on the S7, braking distances were a little bit longer than the Mercedes-Benz CLS 550 the last time I tested it. However, this was a little bit shorter than the BMW 6 Series Grand Coupe, so I'm going to give this an A. When it comes to handling, I'm going to have to separate handling feel from handling ability because all three entries in this segment are incredibly good when it actually comes to handling ability. Handling feel, however, differs a little bit because this is a little bit heavier up front, so it doesn't feel quite as willing to turn as the two entries that are lighter up front. However, actual handling ability is just about equal. And actually, I think this road holds a little bit better than the Mercedes-Benz CLS 550. The way that Audi did that with the S7 is with those very, very wide tires up front, and that's why I commented on them earlier, because 275 with tires on the front of a vehicle are very, very wide in practically every segment. You don't normally find tires this wide up front until you start looking at really high-performance SUVs. The wide tires up front more than compensate for the fact that about 60% of the weight is riding on the front axle in this vehicle. Now on the downside, we get less steering feel out of this vehicle, so it's a little bit harder to tell what the front wheels are actually up to. Again, in the Audi's favor, however, modern electric power steering has really sapped a lot of the feeling out of basically everybody's steering rack, so the difference isn't as big as you might think. The S7 has something else that causes mixed reviews, and that is this dynamic air suspension. This air suspension is actually very similar to what we see in full-size luxury cars and something like a Range Rover or a Jeep Grand Cherokee Summit. However, this is, of course, a performance vehicle, so that may surprise people out there. But air suspensions can be used to both improve the ride and improve handling. In the S7, that air suspension gives us the best ride in this segment. I'm going to give this an A+. Now, I have heard from a number of people out there who didn't really care for the way this particular air suspension behaved. And it is going to behave, of course, different than a traditional steel spring suspension out on these winding mountain roads with potholes, etc. However, I actually prefer the feel. Perhaps that's because I'm used to it. I do own a vehicle with a standard air suspension. The difference between this and a steel spring suspension is going to be that when you go over some of these bumps and undulations on the road, it's going to feel a little bit floaty boaty compared to a traditional suspension. Now on the flip side, it's going to be an awful lot more comfortable. And personally, I'd take the more comfortable ride. This is also an awful lot less punishing than you'll find in something like a CLS 63 AMG. I think that's just a little bit too firm for my tastes. Cabin noise came in a little bit higher than I expected at 69.5 decibels, so I'm going to have to give this a B. I did find both the BMW and the Mercedes to be a hair quieter. When it comes to fuel economy, I am a little bit torn because we have been averaging around 19 miles per gallon in this vehicle as long as you don't drive it too hard. And if you do start driving it hard, you will drop down there into the low teens. With any vehicle that produces 450 horsepower, anything higher than that really would be a surprise, so I'm going to give this a C. I think the road that we are on here really highlights the performance benefits of the Audi S7 because the Quattro all-wheel drive system is very sure-footed. It handles these narrow winding mountain roads incredibly well. The suspension is well-tuned in this vehicle. It's not harsh or upsetting. It's not bruising my kidneys as we go down these roads. And the all-wheel drive system really helps this car around the corners as well. Now, optionally, you can get a torque vectoring axle in the S7. I am a little bit sad that that's not standard, but I would strongly recommend getting it. Audi's A6 starts at $46,200, but the A7 starts at $68,300. So you may be thinking to yourself that creating this form out of the other will set you back around $20,000. But the difference is actually more like 10, because the A6 is not configured the same way as the A7. The A6 starts as a front-wheel drive vehicle in the United States with a four-cylinder engine. This starts out configured more like the A6 3.0. Now we do get a few more standard features in the A7 than we do get in the A6, but it still will cost you about $10,000 in order to squash the roof line right here and then give you that lift gate instead of a trunk. For the S7 model we've been taking a look at here, the price tag starts at $82,900. This model as equipped is right around 95. Now the price differential between this and the A6 is not unusual in this segment because a Mercedes-Benz CLS 550 4Matic, which would be the closest competitor to this on the Mercedes-Benz side, will cost you just about as much more than a Mercedes-Benz E550. Over on the BMW side, the difference is actually a little bit larger because the 650i xDrive Grand Coupe is $94,895 starting.
Part of the reason things are different over there in BMW land is because they arrived at this general shape in a different manner, as I said earlier. They took a six series and they stretched it to create a four door coupe shaped sort of vehicle. And instead, Audi and Mercedes Benz took their regular old mid size luxury sedan and converted it into this form that we see here. That means that the 6 Series doesn't share quite as much with the 5 Series. Obviously, they're very closely related, just like this is closely related to the A6. However, on the inside, the 6 Series gets a very unique interior. And the CLS and this S7 don't get different interiors than their midsize sedan counterparts. The Mercedes-Benz CLS starts a little bit less expensive than the A7. It has been around, of course, a little bit longer as well. When we're comparing like model for like model, that CLS 550 formatic is a little bit less expensive than this S7 we see right here. It also has a traditional automatic rather than a dual clutch transmission. Now, normally that would be more of an advantage over there on the Mercedes side, because typically dual clutch transmissions are not as smooth as automatics. But I have been extremely impressed with the dual clutch transmission that Audi is using in these latest models. It is almost as smooth as a regular automatic, even in low speed crawl and hill climbing situations. Now, obviously it is still not quite as smooth as a traditional automatic, but the difference is so small these days that I actually like the way this operates better than the Mercedes automatic. On the flip side, I do like the way the Mercedes Benz CLS looks. I think that the front end is definitely more aggressive, more dynamic than we look here. I also like the rear end styling on that CLS just a hair better. The E-Class and the CLS also have interiors that are not looking as fresh as the Audi we have here. Now the actual age of the interior is not really that different than we get over here on the Audi side, However, I think the general design is just a little bit behind the times. The current Mercedes-Benz command system that we get in those vehicles is definitely a step behind iDrive or Audi's MMI that we find over here in the A7. That general aging of the interior affects the CLS pretty much across the board, because if you get the optional massaging seats and the dynamic bolsters in that seat, we get a very strange little module on the right side of the driver's seat to control those options. It just doesn't look as well integrated as we find over here. Of course, the Mercedes is also notably less expensive than this S7 that we're seeing right here. So you could forgive some of that difference for the approximately $6,000 price delta between the two. In terms of driving dynamics, I do prefer the way the CLS 550 drives. It has a slightly better weight balance than we get over here in the Audi model. That is noticeable when you're really pushing the car hard in the corners. However, the difference is mainly down to feel. There really isn't that much of a actual handling difference between the two because Audi puts extremely wide tires up front in this model and they've really sorted the suspension out to an excellent degree. Because the difference primarily comes down to feel, I would have to say that I like the ride in this model more than I like the improved feel that we get over there in the Mercedes. And so I would take the S7 over that CLS 550 formatic. The BMW 6 Series Grand Coupe is more expensive than the A7 across the board, basically, when you're comparing like model to like model. The 650i xDrive, which would be the approximate competitor to this, starts at 94895 and the model we have right here started a lot lower than that and ended up at $95,000 by the time they added a lot of options to it. If you had those same options over there on the BMW, you will be more expensive than we're seeing right here. The BMW produces 445 horsepower out of its twin turbo V8 engine, which is just a little bit less than we find over here in the S7. On the flip side, the weight balance on that A6 is a little bit more advantageous. It's an awful lot closer to 50-50 than we find right over here in the Audi. Like the comparison with the CLS, however, that mainly changes the feel over there in the BMW. Absolute grip is not really that far off because yet again, Audi puts those seriously wide tires on the front of this S7. Where the 6 Series definitely shines over this A7 right here is on the inside. I prefer iDrive over MMI in terms of the infotainment system. And in general, the 6 Series just has a more unique and slightly more special looking interior. A larger number of the 6 Series will have full leather dashboards. The overall design of the dashboard, I think, is a little bit more attractive. It's also more unique, however, because again, this uses the same interior basically as the A6, which is much more common in the United States, whereas the 6 Series shares interiors only within the 6 Series family. So the dashboard, the door designs, etc., they're all very unique there inside the 6 Series product portfolio. You don't find those same designs in the 5 Series. All three models suffer when it comes to rear seat accommodations. These can be seen of sort of as the emergency back seats. These are sort of the sedan equivalent of the crossover's third row. The headroom in the back is limited. All three models have seat bottom cushions that are a little bit closer to the ground than I find comfortable. And really they're designed for the person that needs to occasionally carry people in the back, say to a business lunch away, something along those lines. 
But if you have a family of four and you have especially teenagers that are relatively tall, they're not going to find the rear end nearly as comfortable as an E-Class, a 5 Series, or an A6. The 6 Series is less practical than the A7 right back here in the cargo area because it has that traditional trunk. It doesn't have this lift back that we see in vehicles like this or in the BMW X4, for instance. This means that when you fold down those rear seat backs, we have access to this incredibly large opening all the way from here to there, so you can actually put large bulky items in the back of your A7 or S7 and carry them home. That means that in this kind of vehicle, you actually could go out, buy a barbecue at Home Depot, shove it in the back here, and take it home, and you couldn't do that in a 6 Series. If the price tag had absolutely no bearing on my overall judgment, then I would take the BMW 650i xDrive, because its interior is definitely more my cup of tea. I like its driving dynamics just that little bit better. I think I like the overall exterior style a little bit better than this particular S7. However, the price tag is a factor, and that price tag is much bigger than we get over here in the Audi. Just base models right out the door, the BMW is going to cost you $12,000 more than the Audi. And honestly, the 6 Series does not feel $12,000 better in terms of handling out on the road. The Audi, as I said, is incredibly close. I wouldn't pay really that much difference in order to get the increased feel that we get in the 6 Series. Therefore, the A7 and S7 really are my winners in this particular segment. Although this is more expensive than the Mercedes-Benz CLS, I like the overall design, I like the freshness of the interior design better than we find over there in the Mercedes. Interestingly enough, that continues on up to the RS7 model, which is only $1,000 more expensive than the CLS AMG, considerably less than the BMW M6 Grand Coupe. Well, I don't think this is quite as engaging as the M6 Grand Coupe, especially because that M6 is rear-wheel drive, and this would be all-wheel drive. It's going to be a little bit more fun out there. Although I really like the way rear-wheel drive vehicles drive, I prefer the way they drive out on a track. In the real world, when we're driving on gravel roads like we're on right here, or just out there in the mall parking lot, I prefer all-wheel drive, to be perfectly honest. It solves a lot of those traction issues that you get when you get high-performance vehicles with that much power and only two wheels delivering the power to the ground. So I would actually take the Audi RS7 over the M6 on that reason alone. Now, if BMW suddenly decided to put all-wheel drive in the M6 Grand Coupe, my mind might change because it is the pinnacle of performance in this particular category. However, honestly, up until that point, I would take the Audi instead. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, this has been the 2016 S7. Be sure and click those related videos down there at the bottom of your screen. Click the subscribe button, and I'll see you next week.